So thanks for, for joining and, and I'm excited to talk some more about, you know, as we think about extreme events and, and ways that we can prepare for them. Um, I, I'm wanting to share a little bit um, from my kind of area of expertise where we're really looking at contamination in the environment, how we understand the impacts of um, different events, but also how we can also assess the the risk factors associated with contamination and also evaluate the effectiveness of different management strategies for you know, protecting the environment, protecting people's health. Um, and so I'm going to be sharing some work that I, I've been involved in related to understanding surface water quality in response to um, extreme flooding events. Um, and so hurricanes and um, other extreme rainfall um, that can result in an extreme flooding is a concern for many different reasons. You know, we have the physical health and safety of, of people and, you know, livestock of other animals. Um, and, you know, as Colleen kind of discussed, there are many things that we should do to kind of prepare and um, reduce losses and, and maintain operations during these types of events. So I'm really going to be honing in and focusing in on um, how these events might interact with different operations and infrastructure systems um, to, to actually result in contamination that can pose you know, a risk to, to people's health and well-being. And, you know, whenever Hurricane Florence, um, so I, I moved to North Carolina in, in 2018, and this was right as, you know, Hurricane Florence um, came through, and there were many articles in the news um, talking about flood water quality, representing different concerns from both, uh, you know, the swine, hog lagoons, um, but also from municipal waste and, and wastewater treatment systems. And so when these events happen, there is this kind of dialogue about what are the risks, who, and sometimes there's, you know, finger pointing that goes on. Um, and, but what I'm really interested in how we can understand these complex systems to, to under, to predict where we would see issues with contamination, to identify the sources of the contamination, and to evaluate different strategies to, to reduce contamination that we might see um, when, an, when a rainfall event happens. And so there are many different sources of um, contamination to the environment. And in particular, I, I really study fecal contamination and the risk that it poses regarding um, human illness and disease. And there are many different types of pathogens that are found in feces of both humans and animals. And so when we think about pathogens and feces, there are you know, bacterial pathogens, there are viral pathogens, and then there are eukaryotic um, pathogens that are protozoa and nematodes. And, um, and some of these you might be familiar with, you know, from bacteria, we have you know, different strands of E. coli, E. coli 0157H7, um, Campylobacter, Salmonella, um, some of the viral pathogens that might be familiar, like rotavirus, adenovirus, norovirus, um, SARS-CoV-2, so COVID-19 is caused by a viral target. Um, <clears throat> And then some of the eukaryotic ones are, you know, Cryptosporidium, Giardia, um, Ascaris is, is a soil transmitted helmet. Um, and so there are many different types of pathogens that we might be concerned about that could be found in fecal material. And these pathogens are transmitted um, through this fecal oral transmission pathway where the, the feces of an infected individual has high concentrations of these pathogens it can be transmitted through the environment um, and through surfaces. Um, so this is known as the 5F diagram. So fluids, fields, flies, fingers, food um, are the dominant transmission pathways for these pathogens to get from you know, the feces of an infected individual to then be um, ingested orally to infect a new, a new individual. <clears throat> 
And as I mentioned, you know, these pathogens that can infect human are found not just in human feces, but also in non-human animal feces. So this, this shows kind of the probability of illness associated with exposure to the feces of different animal hosts. And um, this is, you know, notable because, you know, how people engage with fecal matter depending on the host might be different. And um, so I also work some in recreational water quality. And, you know, sometimes you might get exceedance, exceedances for, um, water quality standards. Um, but, you know, sometimes the beach manager would say, well, it's, it's all coming from the seagulls, right? And so it is important to know, like, is, is the fecal contamination coming from seagulls, which has a lower kind of probability of illness relative to coming from a human source like sewage or from another source like cattle? Um, and so the source of the contamination does matter, but that there are zoonotic pathogens and, and and domestic animal feces as well. And so what I would argue is that we do see, you know, significant production of fecal material from humans, from livestock, um, from domestic animals. Um, and, you know, I think we have management strategies that are available, but I do think that we are seeing a lot of innovation and in management strategies as well. And so I think this is an important thing to know is that you know, understanding how we assess water quality or the impacts of these type of events is important for evaluating how different forms of infrastructure, how effective they are at actually managing um, contamination. And so, um, I would say that we are seeing more opportunities for innovation and more areas are, are trying new things, which I think is really great. Um, and, and we do see that there is a lot of loading of fecal contamination in the environment globally, um, also domestically, and that there is a need for us to continue to identify these strategies and to make sure that they are cost effective and that they are feasible to implement. Um, and, and as I mentioned, you know, the whole kind of basis for management of, of fecal material, um, there is the nutrient um, component that it can be harmful for the environment, the nutrients that enter the environment. But my kind of focus is, is more on the microbial contaminants that carry a significant health risk um, to human populations. And so I'm going to take a little time to provide a bit of an overview of understanding how we measure water quality, why we do it the way um, that we do so that um, it, this can help kind of inform whenever you're reading reports or understanding kind of um, monitoring uh, criteria that it might help give a sense of, of what the different measurement options are. So in terms of measurement, if we're concerned about you know, the health risk, um, it could make sense to actually go and measure, you know, these enteric pathogens and see, you know, is there contamination with these pathogens that would cause disease? But unfortunately, um, you know, it's, it's quite challenging to, to actually measure pathogens in environmental samples. And it's because they're often found in low concentrations. So you would have to really concentrate your environmental sample. Um, and when you concentrate an environmental sample, that can also lead to um, difficulties in, in actually distinguishing your, your target because it might there might be other materials or compounds or organisms in the sample that could impact um, the effectiveness of your method. There are also many pathogens to target, as I showed you earlier, the list of all the different enteric pathogens. There's, there's a lot to target, and sometimes we might not know which are the priority pathogens to target, and these are quite expensive to test. And so if there are so many, and it costs a lot of money, um, it, it can become quite logistically challenging. Um, and, and it also can take a lot of time to test all of these pathogens. You know, to do some work to, um, to detect salmonella, it can take up to seven days before you actually have like confirmation of your result, right? And so that's a lot of time to, to get insight about water quality. And it requires skilled technicians, which adds to cost and, and the infrastructure. And so with water quality monitoring, we typically rely on indicator organisms. 
And we really would want an indicator that's, you know, low cost, easy to measure, gives us timely results, correlates to what we care about, either the pathogens or the health outcomes. Um, and, and I would argue that we actually don't have an ideal indicator, right? We don't have one that works perfectly, but we have some that have been shown to be um, quite effective and are used in a lot of the, the standards for, for water quality. And so fecal indicator bacteria, and in particular E. coli and Enterococci, are two organisms that are used um, to indicate fecal contamination. And they are, are, are typically involved in some of these recreational water quality standards, shellfish water quality standards, um, runoff standards, stormwater runoff. Um, and so these are our common indicators organisms that have correlated to health outcomes um, in different epidemiological studies. Um, but these organisms are found in the feces of, of multiple animal hosts. So it's not just human feces that has these organisms, but it's also non-human animals. Um, so, you know, cattle, uh, swine, all, all like all the different types of avian species. Um, and so there is kind of a concern that whenever you're using these indicator organisms, how, what is the risk associated with finding this in indicator organism? And how do you use this insight to actually inform action? And so microbial source tracking techniques have been to develop, have been developed so that you can have um, kind of a, a specific, a source specific response um, in your management approach so that you can address um, the fecal contamination from the appropriate source. And it can also help narrow um, your evaluation of different types of intervention or infrastructure introduction um, so that you're really targeting the effect of you know, your strategy on the particular host of contamination that you're wanting to evaluate. And as I mentioned earlier, the health risks do vary by source. So as we can have source identification, we can better understand what is the health risk with a certain um, water quality measurement. And so I'm not going to go into exactly how microbial source tracking works because uh, I'm mindful of time, but these use molecular methods. So um, looking at kind of DNA sequences that are host specific, that you can then detect these specific um, DNA sequences to say whether there's human fecal contamination or you know, cattle specific fecal contamination or poultry specific contamination. Um, so I, I was involved in some surface water quality monitoring after Hurricane Florence. And just as a reminder, Hurricane Florence dropped kind of historical um, record rainfall over a you know, four day period um, was, was really the, the hurricane slowed down. And so just sat and dumped a lot of rain in Eastern North Carolina. And you know, we see extreme flooding and you know, not all types of rainfall events will, will give the same response in the environment. And so flooding might increase your connectivity to contaminant sources, but also it's the large volume of water. And, you know, if you hear like dilution is the solution to pollution, you know, sometimes that rainfall event might result in dilution of contaminants. Um, and, and so what are the different time lags? What are the different drivers for what we might see in terms of contamination in the environment? And so I was a part of some rapid response research and I'm going to just share a few of the, the insights related to microbial contamination after Hurricane Florence. Um, we sampled at 40 different sites in Eastern North Carolina that received large amounts of rainfall. We sampled about a week after landfall once the roads were passable and then a month later. So we have two different time points of sampling, phase one and phase two, and we, and we looked for many different microbiological contaminants, including the general like fecal indicator bacteria E. coli, but also human and swine specific targets, as well as um, a few um, different pathogens, enteric pathogens. And we actually see variation in water quality. And so we sampled both 
floodplains, um, channels of, of rivers and streams, and then also some isolated ephemeral water bodies. Um, and we did see that about 30% of the samples had quite high levels of E. coli that were above this kind of beach advisory value, so a recreational water quality standard, and 15% of them had extremely high concentrations of E. coli, over 400 NPN. And this was both, this was between phase one and phase two. Um, we actually saw similar concentrations between like these two different phases of sampling. Um, however, the floodplain waters had lower concentrations in phase two as compared to phase one. And so we perhaps saw some decay of the organisms over time in, in the floodplains. Um, we saw the human specific fecal target in 26% of the samples. And it was somewhat inconsistently detected at sites between the two different phases where some sites were positive in phase one and not phase two and then vice versa. Um, and the swine target was detected in 9% of um, samples, and it was actually pretty consistent detection that if we saw it in phase one, we were also seeing um, that swine target in, in phase two detection. And um, I, I just want to mention that um, Arcobacter was also a pathogen that um, we saw in the majority of our samples. And this was this is a pathogen that's not typically on people's radar, but it's kind of growing. Um, it's an emerging uh, pathogen in terms of environmental um, prevalence. So, um, so yeah, so just some of the takeaways are, you know, we saw, you know, high levels of fecal contamination after Hurricane um, Florence, and there is still a lot that we can do to better understand what are the impacts of flooding, um, how, how does it change depending on the rainfall event, how does contamination then persist in soil and sediment after the rainfall event, so that we can better um, protect people's health and better um, inform our, the different intervention and infrastructure strategies for you know, keeping um, contamination low um, during these types of events. All right, so yeah, with that, I will stop and um, pass it on to the next presenter.